All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, uh, no matter where you're at in this geo-distributed world. Um, we have a tech talk today on the architecture of a geo-distributed database. Now, um, you know, uh, this is going to be a fairly technical talk. We're not going to get way too deep into, you know, deep down into the, the bits of, you know, how we actually coded all this in Go. Um, but today I wanted to go over a, a, an overview of kind of the architecture and the way that we think about things here in a distributed database and really, you know, kind of uncover some of the details and, and how the implementation of the database is really different um, and how that actually allows us to implement and get something called distributed SQL ultimately. So, um, so that's really what our topic is today. Um, but first, a little bit of housekeeping. This is me. That's me. Hi, I'm Jim. Uh, I'm your presenter today. Um, I'm actually in product marketing. I'm originally a developer and kind of geek out on deep, deep tech stuff. So, you know, when my teams are talking about hash joins and these type of things, I, I, I love this stuff because it, it kind of it gets me back into closer to code and, and closer into technical stuff, but definitely a marketer. Um, but I'm actually, I'm actually really happy to take um, questions today. Uh, like I said, we're going to give a, kind of a, a, you know, I would say we're not going to be a 10,000 foot level description of, of the architecture. But I'm not going to be at the three foot level either. Um, I'm not going to get into code. I'm going to try to stick around the, the 100, 200 foot level. But I'm happy to take questions along the way. Um, there is a QA panel, which I'm monitoring. Um, and we'll um, look for questions there. There's also a chat. If you have an issue with anything, please uh, do, do check in on the chat. I know um, Jessica will help you um, sort out whatever that is. At the end of this, we'll also have a survey. We love feedback. We love to make sure these things are valuable to you. Um, we typically get lots of feedback um, after webinars, so thanks to anybody who's done that before. And then before anybody asks, yes, definitely. A, a recording of this will be available to everybody. And we'll send that out as part of the thank you um, follow-up email that we sent to everybody. So um, with that, let's get into it. Uh, we got a lot of material today. Um, I've got 55 minutes. I think it's going to be about 40, 45, something like this. I haven't, I haven't done this presentation end in a while, and I added a couple of new things. So Forgive me if I stumble in spots, but I think it's going to work out pretty well. So, all right. So first of all, you know, I think there's this concept of like, why do we even need another database? And, and this slide in the next one is actually pretty important. Um, you know, this guy, Merv Adrian, Merv Adrian, I've, I've known for, for a while. He's a pretty smart guy. You know, he's been with Gartner a long time, analyzes, uh, you know, databases in particular. I know he was heavy on the Hadoop game and all these different things. But, you know, I think, you know, if you, if you look at what like people like this are saying, you know, the future of all, all data and, and everything and anything for a database is, is going to be the cloud. Now, this is actually forcing some, some changes to our traditional databases. You know, we can take a traditional instance of Postgres. We can take a traditional instance of MySQL or Oracle, kind of these things that were built for kind of a single server and, and run it in the cloud. We could take a VM and all and run it, and, and we're going to get some benefits there. But, but how do we take advantage of the cloud in terms of its scale or its resilience or it, uh, you know, the way in which it's geo-distributed and geolocated all over the planet, right? And so as we move to the cloud, there's kind of some new requirements that have gone into kind of what we need to think of uh, as we architect a database. And if you take a step back, you start looking at, you know, relational databases, you know, the traditional stuff, you look at NoSQL, um, you know, they're good for scale, um, you know, NoSQL especially, um, but it's really for reads, you know, how do you actually get, you know, distributed transactions that are consistent and, and reliable so that, you know, you do have basic, you don't have anomalies in your data. Um, you know, they're still gonna struggle with that. Um, you know, resilience, you know, we can get resilient with, with the relational database. You take some extra technology and some other things, um, you know, active passive systems. Um, you know, NoSQL kind of solves a lot of that, right? Um, but, but for the cloud, you know, I think NoSQL was a good step in the right direction, but it, it's typically for kind of these, these web scale architectures and kind of for read, whereas, you know, distributed SQL was built with all of this in mind. Um, and, and, you know, this, this whole cloud scale and, you know, the delivery of microservices really kind of taken us to a new approach to, if we think about kind of this relational, relational transactional store, you know, our entire modern application stack and the way that we deliver software has changed, you know, from Kubernetes to CI CD to, to, you know, Terraform and our, the way we, you know, declarative infrastructure and all those things. You know, all of that has changed. I get for that matter, right? All of this has changed. And, and, and as we kind of move towards this new world um, of microservices and, and gaining the benefits of these distributed systems, what's the distributed database for that new world? And that's really kind of, I think, the genesis of where distributed SQL came from. 
you know, the genesis of, of CockroachDB actually goes all the way back to, uh, you know, Google Spanner and the Spanner white paper that, uh, that Google published. If you, if you want to have an interesting read in the middle of the night when you're really bored and you're trying to fall asleep, um, check out the Google Spanner white paper from, uh, yeah, from Google. And, and, and a lot of the concepts that are there is really what's fueling kind of this, this push towards distributed database. And a lot of the concepts I'm going to go through today in terms of our architecture are directly from that paper and, and where that came from. And that, that really kind of, you know, sets the tone of kind of where these things come from. So what is a distributed SQL database? Well, as I said, it's kind of an evolution of, of a database. Um, but first and foremost, it, it actually, it speaks SQL. It has to implement a standard SQL interface. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, it needs to ease scale. We can't, you know, adding new nodes isn't gonna have to actually allow us to do manual sharding and all these things. Like we have to actually take advantage of the scale of the cloud. Um, it needs to be always on, resilient everywhere. Um, uh, it needs to be ASCII compliant. I think that's just a, a, a general kind of requirement of a SQL database, right? Um, but to what level? Uh, well, I think the I in ACID is one of those things that, uh, that are really, really important. So, um, and then finally, you know, if you're gonna be distributed, tying data to a location is absolutely critical because latencies become a very big problem. If you have instances of a database that are distributed across an entire globe, or even just two regions, say in the United States, you know, the, I, can't, I can't beat the speed of light. Uh, so if we're able to tie data to locations, we can start to do things like you know, meet latency requirements. And we can configure the database to do different things. And that's, I think that's one of the unique things about distributed SQL that is different. Um, than anything we've ever seen before because of the distributed nature of it. And that's where, you know, if we just think about just taking a, a traditional legacy database and put it into the cloud, uh, put it in multiple different regions, you just gotta start thinking about transactions and, and latency and, and how does the architecture of the database, the SQL execution layer, right? How does that actually change to kind of deal with some of these, these, these latency issues that are out there, right? I think that's, what's a, that's a key difference, right? So, Cockroach CD is unique. Uh, it is each node is a self-contained unit. I like to call it its own atomic unit. So if you're a distributed systems person, um, we always think about you know um, you know the shared nothing principle. Um, and so you know each instance of cockroach is it's is the same binary. So there's nothing shared across all of them. The other thing that's actually really important to think about when you think about cockroach is every node in cockroach is a consistent gateway to the entirety of the database. So while we'll have you know you know, nine or 27 or, you know, I don't know, 54 nodes in a cluster. Um, ultimately, each one of those has access to all the data and the data is distributed across all the nodes in the cluster. We're gonna go through that. Um, but every single node can take on a query. I don't have to go find a particular node to, to ask a query. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about transactions as well. But ultimately, um, you know, what's happening here is some real magic around how we actually use distributed systems to deal with, you know, coordination and consensus uh, for queries. How do I know that data is written in one place is gonna be committed uh, across multiple different nodes? We're gonna walk through that. How do we repair and rebalance data um, when, when nodes are lost or nodes are added to a cluster? Uh, and then finally, how, do I, how am I able to, to how, how do we actually um, tie data to a location? And so that's all kind of part and parcel of what we do here at CockroachDB. And really kind of, one of the, some of the key aspects we're gonna talk through today, okay? So ultimately, CockroachDB uh, is a distributed replicated transactional store. Um, keys and values ultimately at the bottom layer um, are basically, uh, all data is stored as keys and values and they're strings. Um, and, they're, and they're lexicographically ordered by a key uh, throughout the whole thing. We'll walk through that. We also use MVCC to make sure that um, we have concurrency. Um, values are never updated in place. Uh, newer versions are always, always shadow older versions. Um, and we use tombstones to, 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 to delete values. But ultimately, there's this thing called a monolithic key space, which I think is a, a key innovation um, behind what we're doing. I'm sorry to see key, pardon the pun there. See what I did? It's a key innovation, the monolithic key space. So ultimately, within CockroachDB, um, you know, if you think about a database, there's really, I, there's several layers if you really get into the, the deep details. But, you know, ultimately, the database comes down to uh, the language it speaks, so SQL, right? So can it take in SQL commands? Um, Cockroach is actually wire compatible with Postgres, so we look very similar to something that you're kind of already familiar with. Um, and at the bottom layer is storage, because ultimately a database does 
it stores data to disk, right? So there's like this physical connection to some sort of disk somewhere, right? And then between that is, you know, the this, this SQL execution where query plans happen and, you know, we start to do all this kind of magic, right? And so ultimately at the storage layer, what we're doing is we're actually storing all the data um, using a KV store and it's one big monolithic logical key space for each table. Now, why is that important? Well, if we look at traditional databases, and if you look all the way over on the right, if we had an inventory database, you know, we have this, we have a couple of records, an inventory database, you know, the columns are ID, name, and price. You know, every time I added a record to the inventory table, I would just append it at the end. And there's some tricks that are happening, various different things, but if I wanted to actually find a record, um, I would have to do a complete table scan. If I didn't have this name index, I would have to go to a complete table scan of the entire table to actually find that record because if I was looking for, say, bat, I'd have to start at record one, record two, record three, record four, record five. Now, what we've done in relational databases, we, we came up with a concept called an index. And an index is basically an ordered set of values that allow us to find these things much more quicker. So we can do things like algorithms like divide and conquer, and we can start to find data a lot more easily. Like if I want to find bat, well, I take everything between B and G and I cut that down. I only have to look through a, a few records, right? And so there's lots of algorithms that allow us to find data a lot quicker. But there's overhead here, right? There's storage overhead, there's lots of different things. We've created all these, ultimately, these different indexes and they don't actually lend well to distributed environments, right? And so what we've done is taken that a little bit, we've taken a slightly different approach, right? Um, so how do we actually get this tabular data that, that we understand in the SQL world um, in a KV world, right? So um, the, the SQL data has columns and types. So how do we take this and, and, and translate that, right? And that's, that's what this section is about. So um, ALF data in, in CockroachDB is, is stored in these KV pairs. Um, all tables have a primary key and each key value pair um, has kind of these, this, this structure of basically, you know, there's a value that is, that's, that's stored and that's the column value. But the key is this kind of enumeration of several different values, right? And we encode a lot into a key, um, the table, um, an index, um, the key that we actually want to search on, and a column name. That, that's kind of generally what's there. So you could imagine in this monolithic, you know, key value space, you know, there is an, there's going to be an ordered set of keys. So all of the keys and all the, all the records that are for this particular table are kind of in an ordered set. And we'll go through that. But there's only one value. And that's the column value. So for the column name, we're going to column value, but it's going to map that. We're going to map back and we're going to actually encode all this stuff into the key. And that's going to allow us to do some really kind of cool magic. So let's create some tables and load some rows to demonstrate this, right? And so here's a table. We're going to create a table. It's the dog table. ID, name, and weight are my three attributes on that table, my three columns. Um, and here's some, some table entries. Here's an ID. It's my, my, my primary uh, key. Um, there's Carl, he weighs 10.1. There's Downey, she weighs 3.4. Figment, 30, 65th, right? So we basically have some rows here. So how do we actually translate this data? Um, let's take it row by row. So on the left is what we think of as a traditional table. And the right-hand side is what we're actually using underneath the covers in CockroachDB to store this information. And we use it in lots of different ways logically as well, right? So we have dog. Um, we have the index and then we have the column, right? Like we were talking about before, right? The column ID and then the, or the column name and then the column value. The column value is Carl. So for each row here, um, you know, this row 34, Carl 10.1, there's actually two records written over here uh, in our KV store. So let's take Downey. Okay, so Downey has two records as well. And so basically we go through the whole table and you'll see this mapping of kind of the key to the value. Now, this is a really key concept I mean, I keep coming back to key. This is a really actually incredibly powerful concept in what we're doing in CockroachDB and allows us to do some really cool things. Um, because all this information is ordered, we get, to, we get to kind of think about the data a little bit differently. I think the easiest way for me to show this, let me just show this. I hope this is still shown here. Um, but let's just say we had a bunch of, you know, I, I, I like to use Excel to explain this to people, but have you ever done this where you go through and you say, let me sort, let me sort by, by name first right here. And so now I've got all these names in order, right? Alan, Brian, uh, all, uh, did it do it? No, it's not doing it. Oh, come on, man. How could you not work on me right now? There we go. They're going upside down. 
So I can do first, I can sort, I can short, I can sort a column, right? And I can see all the records are sorted in this column. And then if I sort this column, you'll see that all the records are now sorted. Okay, so all the Allens are together, but all the first names within Allen are still sorted, right? By Frank, Kevin, Mark, Matt, Ned, Spencer. And then all the names in Jones are still sorted. Well, what if I had another column here that I was sorting on, let's say country. Well, look at this. All of the values that are UK are here. And then I have last name Allen, Jones, right? And then everything's sorted here. So this is what I mean by this kind of like monolithic ordered key pair, right? This, this key value set. So like, if I can sort all the keys, and you can imagine these things are actually encoded together into, you know, some really cool information that, that we can actually sort through very quickly. Think about this as our table. Now all the records are sorted in a way that makes it real easy and efficient for us to actually go out and find this information. So I'm taking a lot of time here because I think it actually feeds into a lot of information in terms of what we're going to do um, in the rest of this presentation. Let me get this thing back here so I can so I can do this again, right? Uh, in, in terms of some of the magic that's actually built into CockroachDB. So let me get back here. Okay, great. So we take this big key space and we're going to divide it into these contiguous 64 megabit ranges. Now. A range you can think of, I think people think of this sometimes as like shards or smaller pieces, right? And so what we can do is we get this kind of more man manageable uh, chunks of data. And we choose 64 megabits because it actually optimizes the way that we move data around and how we actually split things as well, right? right? Ranges that are large enough to, to amortize the, the, inter the indexing overhead as well, right? Because we don't want to index every single one of these, but we want to have enough information so we can actually be much more efficient. So Every table is broken down into different ranges. This particular table in this example, we're gonna break it down into three ranges. Now, in order to do this, we actually need a, a structure, uh, some sort of index to actually locate ranges. Um, so we'll create another kind of structure like, so you know, the first range is Carl through Jack, Lady to Petey, Pine Top to Z. Those are all dog names, by the way. And it's very much like a B tree. It's, and there's lots of algorithms for us to actually go out and sort that out. So, this is really cool because it actually allows us to not do range scans, right? This, the monolithic ordered key value pair says, look, if I want all the dogs between Muddy and Stella, I don't have to actually look at every single range and go to every node, right? Because remember, this data is going to be distributed all over the place. I don't have to go all over the planet to find the data and do a range scan or a table scan. I can actually just go look at the ranges that I'm concerned about if I want to actually get a, you know, this, this kind of you know, set of data that's in between, right? Um, so that's like one of the one of the cool things, like just an ordered range scan. Um, but what happens on a, on an insert? And, and so what happens when I get you know when I can I can I get data into a range, right? So let's just insert a record into this table. We're going to insert Sunny. It's going to go down here between you know Sushi and Stella, right? Um, and so I'm going to go through the index. I'm going to find the range. It's this red range, um, and I'm going to insert. The first thing it's going to ask is to say, Hey, do I have enough room? Are you uh, under the 64 uh, megabit range chunk. And he's like, he's gonna say, yes, great. Okay, great, insert that thing. So what happens when I now wanna insert Rudy? Um, the 64 megabit range actually is full, right? So what we do is we're gonna split ranges and the database is automatically doing this, which is actually a really key concept in CockroachDB. Um, it allows us to basically expand and contract the database um, very efficiently. We have a way of actually contracting these things back into smaller amount of ranges as well. Um, and so, so as data expands, the database is automatically going to start splitting this data. Um, so if you think about your traditional way of the way that we actually did this as we did manual sharding and this sort of stuff, this was all a manual process. The data is, the, the, the Cockroach DB is just doing this for you, right? And so um, it's a really key kind of concept here. And it's really built off of this whole, you know, the, the monolithic key value store, right? And so we can create this and we have a, now a new range and it's the, I think that's orange. I'm a little colorblind, but I think that's orange, right? So we can insert Rudy now. Um, now all of this is controlled by something called Raft. And if you aren't familiar with Raft, probably a good topic to go and, go and research and kind of familiarize yourself with. Um, but Raft is a distributed consensus protocol. Um, and we think about this, I, I always like to think about the distributed part and then the consensus part um, kind of together, but different, right? Like, yes, this is distributed in that, yes, I need consensus across distributed pieces or elements or nodes or concepts within it, within a cluster of stuff. Um, but I, I, we use it for actually distribution of the data as well. Um, but a raft, in raft, there's this concept called a raft group. And 
Raft allows us to basically take on, you know, multiple different copies of things and create a, a, a replica group, right? Um, and so within Raft, we're taking each of the ranges and we're gonna actually create three replicas. So for that blue range that we saw on the, on the, on the, on the slide before with Lady, Lula, Muddy, and Petey, here would be the Raft group for that, right? We would have three copies of that. And that Raft group is gonna basically manage itself and we're gonna use this to get distributed consensus across all of them because each one of these, these copies, these replicas of that range, they're gonna be stored in different spots. And how do we use Raft to basically coordinate all of that, right? And so um, it's important in Raft that you have an odd number because, well, we couldn't get consensus if we had even, right? Because there's gotta be quorum, right? There's gotta be, you know, three of five or five of seven, right? Um, and, and two replicas doesn't make sense either, right? Because that we would never get consensus. So in Raft, it's a, it's a fairly com complex concept. Um, but there's some great resources out of the web to actually go through it, but it's actually really key and critical to CockroachDB. The core concepts are, there's a RAF group, which, which is actually comprised of three replicas. Um, and these replicas are basically maintained by this distributed consensus protocol called RAFT. okay? Um, it provides for atomic replication of commands. Um, in, in RAFT, there is, of the three replicas, there's something called, in Raft, you'll call it a Raft leader. Um, we call it a leaseholder um, in, in the context of CockroachDB. Um, but the leaseholder is basically kind of the, the main replica, if you will. And if it, it can actually control lots of different things. Um, most importantly, the way that transactions happen, it's actually gonna take a transaction log to make sure that other um, replicas in the group aren't writing at the same time, right? And we're, we're gonna come back to that when we get to transactions. So. What happens with, with range leases? So if you, if you do reads with consensus, um, basically if I wanted to read Carl, I'd have to go out to every one of these nodes, right? If I had you know, three copies of data written across three nodes, I would have to go to three of these nodes and actually get that information, make sure it's all correct, and then return the right value. However, with the leaseholder, what we have to do, we actually, we don't need consensus. We can actually ask the leaseholder um, because that's the leader and that, that leader is actually gonna know um, exactly, um, exactly like a, that, that they have the right amount of data. You're always guaranteed that the leaseholder has, has the exact amount of, it has the exact right data, right? Um, uh, that leaseholder is actually coordinating all rights. Um, it's going to propose rights to the other, to the other replicas. It's going to lock things up so that, uh, you know, things don't get overwritten and it's actually going to help you with all the reads as well. Now we can do things like follower reads within CockroachDB where you, you, can, you can, you know, put some lacks on where this information actually gets uh, read from. So you could read from other replicas and there's lots of different cool things you can do in a database and distributed systems to actually deal with that kind of thing. But, but here we are, we have our three ranges and now we wanna, let's, let's just take a step back before we even get to read and just say, how does this data actually get distributed across physical locations? So I have three ranges and I have four nodes in a, in a distributed cluster, right? Um, what I'm gonna do is I wanna actually start writing data and we can actually place data across various different physical nodes based on how we actually wanna survive whatever failure it is. Um, you know, we can, we can do it by disk, we can do a single machine, we can survive a rack, a data center, a region. And this is all configurable at the table level. So this is going on for each table. Um, and I can say, look, at, I, want, I want two copies of this data to live in region one, and I want one copy to live in region two, so that I can survive the failure of a region, right? And so basically, we can actually do that at the table level in CockroachDB, and you can do it on the fly, too, so that, you know, if you had decided you, you, you want to change that from surviving a region to, um, it's okay, I just want better latency, so I want all data in the region where it needs to live. I can actually change that on the fly and the data will be actually be redistributed and reallocated on different physical nodes within CockroachDB. And so um, really that's all up to the, the, the configuration of how you actually think about these things. It's one of the unique things about implementing a distributed database. And you have to think about latency and, and resiliency as you kind of go through these things. But here we are, we're gonna place data on these different nodes. So I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna optimize here for storage. Uh, so I wanna even out, even out storage across the entire cluster. Um, and so here we go, we have three, the, the blue, the three blue replicas are being stored on node one, node two, node three, 
And then finally, the three um, uh, red, red replicas are being kind of stored on two, three, and four. And the database was smart enough to actually just distribute this um, generically so that we can actually even out um, by storage so that we have actually the, the right amount of data across all these. And so the right amount of usage across each one of them. Now, another way that we can actually um, control where, where data is being actually stored is by load. So sometimes there's, there's something called like a hot range, we'll call it, right? And a hot range is where there is a part of data, like this is say this muddy record, because muddy, that's, that's my old dog. It's the most popular dog in the world, the best dog in the world. Um, you know, muddy's being accessed all the time, or lots of records within this range are being accessed. Um, the, the database is smart enough to actually, ex, you know, to, to put that range um, or, you know, put these replicas on nodes where it's not going to be, uh, where, it can, where we can actually optimize for compute as well, right? And so we can use heuristics that consider real-time usage of the data itself and start to, start to put that intelligently where it needs to be, right? But this is happening, like, at mass volume across lots of, I mean, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of ranges across, you know, lots of different tables in real time. And so not only can we optimize based on storage, but we can optimize based on, on compute as well, which is kind of cool, right? And so here we go, look at the database took all the, let's see this, the yellow one here. Um, and we put those three replicas there. We put the three red replicas on the same node. And then we actually excluded out the blue replicas into their own nodes, so we can actually get better performance, uh, and we can actually um, distribute that workload more evenly across nodes that weren't being utilized, so that we can actually have better performance, right? And so this is all happening underneath the covers. Um, there's nothing that the the DBA or the application developer needs to do. You know, Cockroach is just going to take care of this and deal with these things, and so. This is kind of one of those unique things when you start to think about, you know, cloud and what happens, you know, as a database moves in this new world. If you had multiple instances of, let's say, Postgres or MySQL, and you're trying to coordinate them all, how do you even start to think through where, you know, sets of data needs to be stored on different nodes because you want to optimize for performance and compute and, and, and the cost of those sort of things, right? I think it's easier to do for storage, a lot, a lot less, less easy to do for um, things like, you know, a compute, right? So this is kind of one of those unique things where when you get into distributed architecture and, and architecting from the ground up to be different, this is kind of one of those unique things, right? And so in architecting from the ground up, I think, you know, starting with the KV store, what I talked about is, is, is a really critical piece there. So the last uh, bit I want to talk about replica placement is um, really making sure that, you know, we can actually start to do things like geo partitioning. And so this, this is the mix of between the last two things I, saw, I spoke about, right? So because we have this, this sorted monolithic, uh, you know, KV pair, like the, like the example I showed you in the, in the, in the sheet really quickly, um, we can now make sure that certain ranges are tied to a particular location. Now, in this case, I'm using location as, you know, you know a, a geographic area. But ultimately, you know, when it comes down to implementation, each one of these nodes, there's three nodes here in US West, you three nodes US East, and let's say, I don't know, there's three nodes in Portugal, Portugal it looks like. What we're doing is we're tagging those nodes at a particular location, and the database is taking care of where those ranges are written. So we put a constraint um, for this replica placement. Now, I can do things like I can deploy a node in multiple different clouds, or I can deploy nodes that are you know, on-prem and in the, in the cloud. And I can use this sort of replica placement and understanding what's inside the data in the table itself to start to put data in the right place. So you could imagine I have data that lives on-prem, it's always tied to on-prem nodes, and some that's in the cloud, it's always tied to, to, um, you know, to the cloud. Now, the coolest thing is, um, if data is located, let's say the blue data is always in, in US East, I can ask for data via any one of these nodes in the entire system. This comes back to this, you know, every, every node within Cockroach is a consistent gateway to the rest of the database. So if I have an application that's running out here in the West, right, say in San Francisco, I can actually hit a server that's closer to me to ask for that data. Now the database itself, these three nodes that are living in the West actually know that, oh, Muddy, that's in the, that's in the, that's in the US East. So I need to go ask the, the, that data from there or from one of those nodes where the leaseholder is, and it's gonna return that data, right? That's pretty cool, right? So now I have one database that's spanning multiple different regions. 
um, and I'm storing data in, in each particular place. Now, if I had optimized um, so that, you know, we weren't using geo partitioning and say, you know, I just wanted like two pieces of data in one region, one in a, in a, in a third, right? We would actually get the, the resiliency. We'd actually lose a whole region, but we still have access to all that data um, from, from any node. And it's kind of one of those magic things about CockroachDB and a distributed database that's really cool. Um, you know, ask any node, you're going to be able to find the data. Okay, so this all acts like one virtual big database. It's like, it looks like one database, but I tell you what, it's, it, it's distributed all over the place, right? Um, so one of the, actually, one of the questions, I actually want to come back to this question. It's a really good question, actually. So doesn't splitting ranges cause a lot of data movement, taking too much compute power? Um, actually, it, it, when we split ranges, we actually become more efficient in the way that we access the data. So in the long run, we're actually using less compute power because of the distribution of data and we can actually find data a lot quicker because we don't have to do as deep uh, table scans, right? And so uh, ultimately in the long run, we actually save a lot of compute is, is, is one of the questions. Um, one, of, one of the other nuances as well. So when we get to actually um, splitting ranges of data, we aren't doing that in real time. So like, let's go back to this, this example where we were doing this split, right? And so I wanted to insert this. You know, actually when I, when I, when I did this, you know, the database is smarter to say like, okay, yeah, let, let's take Rudy, let's put Rudy into this range and let's go a little bit up on, a little bit below, beyond 64 megabit. And let's do this split later. Once everything's committed and everything's sorted out and everything's back in order, let's come back and do this. So, you know, we aren't gonna actually overload the database at any time. We're actually gonna allow, I mean, ultimately what's, what's going on underneath the covers is, you know, CockroachDB is gonna allow a range to go a little bit bigger than it needs to go but it's going to actually do that split later. So it isn't actually stopping a transaction from happening. So there are two sides of that question in terms of, um, you know, does, does splitting and the data movement, you know, take too much computing power? Ultimately, in the end, yeah, we're, we're doing some splits and we have to move some data around, but it actually saves us a lot of compute because we're actually distributing the data across multiple different nodes. And we work that back. And then further, uh, secondly, you know, we aren't actually doing the split in real time during a transaction. We often do that uh, after the fact so that we don't actually hold things up. All right. So let me get back to where I am. All right. Um, so another unique capability and, and kind of one of these things that we think about cloud, right, and, and how these things work, um, you know, we rebalance replicas as well. So if we add a node to a cluster, um, CockroachDB will actually automatically deal with redistribution of, of replicas, right? Um, you know, we use these heuristics that I just spoke through to actually move data around. So, you know, we had our four, node, four nodes and then all of a sudden we added, you know, node five. What happens in this scenario? Well, the database is smart enough to just start moving data around to optimize for what we want to optimize for in the database. So we're optimizing for storage. So what it did is it just moved one of the replicas over so we have even storage across all the boards as, as much as we possibly could, right? And so we just expanded the database and sharded everything and moved things around uh, without any manual intervention. Simply spin up a node, point it at the cluster, and as long as you have a TLS connection, you can actually connect, right? And we're gonna actually now have the data redistributed. So you could imagine across, you know, hundreds of thousands of replicas, you know, a node being added, uh, it's really easy to scale out a database because all this is happening um, internally in the database itself. Um, we can also do things like, you know, survive a, 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 a permanent failure. Now, Raft is cool, right? Because in Raft, this is kind of one of those cool things about it, you know, we have this concept of replicas and there's always three replicas. Each Raft group, it's, it's, like, it's like three people are holding hands all the time, but they're like geo-distributed. And if I lose one of the people, if I lose one of my replicas, well, the last two that are standing are going, wait a second, I'm missing the, the third replica. We've got to create a new copy of that, right? And so what happens in, in, in CockroachDB is when a node is lost and we lose replicas, right, we, we understand we have, we have under-replicated ranges. And you'll see this in our UI in a couple different places, right? And an under-replicated range means I don't have, you know, the, 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 the core, the quorum. I don't have three, right? And so in this case, I lost a blue and I lost a red. And so the database is smart enough to actually understand, okay, great, create new replicas on other area and other nodes 
uh, and, and optimize for what I actually want to survive as well. And so the database actually underneath the covers does that. Now, the leaseholder is doing that um, at any one time. If I lost a leaseholder, it would actually nominate a new leaseholder. It would nominate a new leader. So if, if the leaseholder, like the leader for the raft leader, had been located on node three, the last two surviving members of that, of that replica group would be like, oh God, let's create a new version. And then amongst the three of us, let's elect a new leader. So we, we always have a leader, right? Because the leader is going to be really important when we get to transactions, okay? And so we're actually able to, to survive a failure. Now, if we take the last thing that we did in terms of, okay, we can scale and we can survive failures. If you combine those two things together, you know, you, you result in this kind of unique capability to do something called a rolling upgrade. Um, how would I upgrade software uh, across a database today? Well, I've got to take it down. I got to take it out of commission. Uh, maybe I have a backup in place. I bring that in place right away. Okay, well, there's a little bit of time where there's lag. I don't know what transactions happen or not. Well, with, with Cockroach CB, I simply bring a node down, right? So here I am, I, I, it's like turning that fire in terms of like, I just push a button and turn it off. Well, just redid the data and made sure everything's back. And then I spin up that node back, I point it back at the cluster, everything gets rebalanced, right? So I can actually spin a node up and down and not have any uh, impact into the availability of the database itself and do something like a rolling upgrade. I could just take down node by node, go across the entire database and actually do this without any impact to to production um, uh, data, which is it's pretty awesome, right? So the combination of those two things together um, is, 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 is really important, right? And so um, one of the other concepts here in terms of, okay, so I can actually, uh, the last thing I wanna talk about, and this is a, a good question. Again, the same person, these are good questions here. Um, so should a leaseholder be geographically closest to the application? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think a leaseholder, which is kind of the, the head of these of these raft replica groups, it needs to be the it needs to be closest to where the where the user is that accesses that data. And that's tricky, right? How do we use heuristics to actually understand where somebody is accessing accessing data? So if somebody in range is actually access, wouldn't it make sense to locate that leaseholder? Um, so we have the leader uh, in the right area so that, you know, if somebody in London's asking that the leaseholder for that data is in London. So we can have data, you know, follow the user, which is actually really, really important. Um, and so we, we actually can do that within the database itself. Uh, let's see here. All right, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to come back to one of those in a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to move on to transactions because there, there's a couple of questions here about transactions, and I think the next section will actually um, address some of that stuff. Okay, so transactions in a distributed database are also uh, difficult, and and I believe this is one of the main reasons you have to actually architect from the ground up. Um, if you're going to do if you if you're going to have two instances of database. Um, and you want to write data into two different places at the same time. Um, you know, I have, I'm, I'm writing, you know, my, my, my bank account in New York. And at the same time, you know, my girlfriend is writing at the bank, at the bank account in Sydney, you know, who wins in, the, in that situation, right? Like the data lives all over the place. Like, and so how do you resolve these, these conflicts that happen in a database? Now, if you're doing something like a distributed storage layer, you're still going to have this, this problem, right? This is why things like Amazon Aurora, they have a single write node because all writes have to go through a single node because they, like, the, like if every node took on transactions, we have to actually re-architect the, the execution layer. The SQL execution layer has to be re-architected to do this. Now you could do things like multi-master, like Aurora has multi-master, but they, you can only have two write nodes. You can't have like these distributed read nodes as well. You're, you're not limited to only two, right? So it actually, it, there's, there's some really tricky things when you get into um, distributed transactions that are really, really difficult to do. Now, um, transactions, you know, in a SQL database, you know, we always think about ACID. Um, you know, what we like to focus on here is, you know, we can, we can get atomic transactions. This is, if everybody understands that. It's the I is the difficult. How do I isolate transactions, right? How do I protect the database from write skews and dirty reads and phantom reads and, and, and non-repeatable reads? And there's lots of different anomalies that can happen in data. Um, at Cockroach, what we've done is we actually chosen to implement serializable isolation, which is the highest level, um, the highest order of, of, of isolation, where all transactions appear as if they've run in serial, serial order. Um, you know, 
we can we could do weaker isolation levels, but that that would create too much of a burden on on the database. And actually, uh, you know, in a distributed database in particular, you start to run into issues of you know data correctness, uh, and that's and that's something that we actually wanted to 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 deal with. Right now, transaction can span different ranges, um, and they are conversational. So let's walk through kind of an example of how a transaction works um, in Cockroach DB real quickly to give you kind of some of the detail in terms of what we had to rewrite. So, you know, we started at the KV store. Now let's, let's move it up a level. So, Raft is really what allows us to provide these atomic rights um, to an individual range, right? So within a range, I have my, my three replicas. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna get quorum across, you know, three of the replicas to actually commit data, right? So let's go back to our example. We had four nodes, uh, and here I have my application. I want to insert into the dogs table. I want to insert two records. I want to insert Sunny and Ozzy. Okay, well, if I start off, what I'm going to do is, so as if you're familiar with kind of how an execution layer of, 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 a, of a database works, you know, you know, we as developers, we just think in SQL. Well, underneath the covers, you know, that, got, that has to turn into code, and ultimately code is, is a series of transactions and you know there's there's something inside a database called a query planner and you know we aren't going to talk about cost-based optimization today but like how and and how we execute a transaction and what we're doing in the in the course of that transaction actually has a has a, has a big say in what happens right and so in this case you know this is actually going to be each transaction this one it's one statement but it's going to actually break down into multiple different kind of uh, parts of a transaction right so the first thing we're gonna do is begin transaction. The second thing we're gonna do is write Sunny. Now, I'm using green as the color here to talk about this as a gateway, because remember, any one of these nodes could have taken this request. You know, so this could be, you know, arbitrarily, any one of these four nodes are actually taking this on. But the first step we're gonna do is we're actually gonna log now to the leaseholder. So when I write this data, I'm gonna find the leaseholder, right? I'm gonna know where that's gonna be without the, within the database, right? I have this, this, this B tree of index, you know, index indexes across all these ranges. I know the table. And I'm gonna find that thing. And we have a set of records within that, within that range that are actually, they're, they're special. And what we do with those, we're actually able to log transactions. Now, in this case, I'm actually gonna log this transaction. So transaction one, which is insert into dogs, like this whole thing, um, it's pending, right? So that's the very first thing I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna try to write Sunny. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write this data, but I'm going to write it and it's saying in yellow until I can commit it. And I'm not going to commit the data. Um, it's like a temporary write here. Uh, and it's just going to basically sit there and wait for everything to done before I actually do this. Now, what's going to happen is, you know, node three is going to acknowledge back that, that range, right? The, the, that replica is actually going to acknowledge back to, to the leaseholder saying, hey, man, I'm good. I got this. Uh, we're, we're good to go. And so right now, the, the transaction, if it was just right sunny, we could have returned back to the application and said we're good because we have two of three replicas have been written, right? And so this is how we've got, we've got quorum for that particular transaction. But wait, we have to do this second step. We actually have to write Aussie as well, right? So we're gonna find that leaseholder. We're gonna actually gonna try to write those records. We're gonna acknowledge them. In fact, that's gonna come back with the acknowledgement. And then once everything actually gets done, I get everything done, now I can actually say commit. Now this transaction record is actually going to go to commit. So what the transaction record would do would say, hey, look, at, I can't start any more transactions um, for these records because I actually have kind of a, a, a lock here on what's going on in this particular range, right? And so, and we can actually, it gets more complex than that um, at the deeper layers, but we can actually now stop that transaction from happening. And once that thing goes to commit, you'll see everything went from yellow to commit and everything's good, everything is stored in the database, and we're looking good, we can now send the acknowledgement back to the application, and we have written that data. Okay, so that's the basics of a transaction, right? So it comes through, we break it down at different points, we create this transaction record, we write to the replicas, replicas come back, we do the second step, they write to the replicas, it comes back, and we get two or three of the replicas are written, we get a commit across both of those different ranges that have to write that data, and then we're actually able to tie that data back to the to the to the originating um, you know user who asked for that other originally request. Now, that's a simple situation, um, you know, and that's a pretty simple um, SQL statement. 
you know, when you start to get into, you know, where clauses and we're doing these, these scans across, you know, lots of different data, um, you know, this gets really, really complex. And there's lots of issues and there's lots of things that can go wrong here. There's a lots of things that can be optimized in terms of, you know, how quickly can we actually return things back? I'm going to talk about pipeline in a little bit just now. Um, but we've done a lot of work in, in a distributed SQL execution layer. And so this is one of those areas where, um, you know, there's, there's, we can, we can distribute the storage layer. I can create like lots of data that's distributed and have lots of people access that. Um, but distributed storage is, is a shared concept or a shared layer, right? It, it divorces the, the true nature of distributed systems and that shared nothing um, kind of pros, uh, concept, right? And so if we're just sharing storage, it doesn't work. This is, this is one of the reasons why, you know, building SQL execution from the ground up is, is actually really, really tricky. And this is not simple to do. It's all done in code. It's all done in Go. If you actually want to look through it, you can actually look through our, our Git repo and, and check it all out if you want to. So the last concept I wanted to actually talk through is, you know, how do you then optimize these things? This is one of the things that we've done. There's lots of things we've done um, to optimize the way these things work, but this is the concept called pipelining. So in the, in the prior, um, uh, set of diagrams, you saw each of these lines, you know, they, they seem to be happening serially, you know, like one after the other. That's the way that I walked through it. And so, you know, the first step was we had to create that transaction. We had to go back and say, hey, great, we created the transaction. And then we write Sunny, we come back, we have this whole thing, right? So we're actually doing all that. We actually create the transaction record and the Sunny thing right away. Um, we're actually sending the Aussie thing at the same time. And then we're actually writing the, the transaction record and we're just basically saying it is a stage, right? Um, and that's basically at the same, you know, it's, it's, it equates to this commit, right? But once all that happens, we can actually have all that come back at once. And as long as this transaction record, this stage transaction record comes back um, in the right order, we're able to look back. We actually save this much time between the serial version of this and the pipeline version of it. So where I was talking about the transaction in kind of like a serial way, like this, then this, then this, then this, um, actually in the database it's, uh, uh, itself, we're actually doing this as, as pipeline. Now, does this work? Uh, have we proven this? Yes, actually we did, we got through a proof uh, using TLA plus. And so this actually kind of works and it's, it's pretty solid kind of um, huge performance uh, increase over the last two releases of which we've done this. Um, so transaction pipeline is kind of one of those more advanced things that we've done um, here within the database itself. So wrapping up, um, you know, we went through a lot, uh, there's a lot here, um, but I covered just, you know, I covered basically five of the, the eight concepts here. Um, you know, this distributed replicated transactional key value store at the bottom, I think is the most interesting thing and, and really what allows us to do lots of different things. We talked about the monolithic key space and how we break that down into ranges and use raft, um, to replicate those ranges. And we use that to basically now um, place replicas across different places, right? Across different signals, across, you know, space or storage, diversity, uh, load, latency, right? And then we talk through transactions uh, and a little bit about distributed SQL and how we actually do that. And then uh, some of the things of how we're doing transactions and pipelining those things. Now, uh, there's a whole other section here about, you know, how we actually execute transactions and how we break things down into uh, how that actually gets executed. And we actually built out a cost-based optimizer, which basically will create a query plan that, that doesn't just use heuristics, it uses statistics across the board to actually start to understand you know, how, these things get, uh, how these things get executed. And in a distributed environment, it gets really, really complex. Um, in a distributed environment, uh, you know, a cost-based optimizer um, is typically taking the, the order in which, in which things are done, you know, your, you know the, 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 the ordering of data, um, the, the select statement, the from, all that, how we actually execute those things, uh, what's going on underneath in the database all gets ordered, um, and we can actually optimize that. If you can start to overlay, um, uh, you know, location into that optimization is where things get really, really interesting. So, so um, let's see here. How do you how do you design your tables, keys, any resources to help think in cockroach design? Um, I'm just going through some of the questions here. Um, that's a great question. Actually, we have a couple of posts, I think, on our blog roll for this of you know, how you actually choose um, keys and indexes for your tables. Um, we can follow up with that. Um, but
but it really depends on what you want to optimize uh, the database for. Again, it comes back to you know thinking through the, your topology of your database and where nodes are going to be, and then what do you want to actually optimize for? Is that resiliency or latency? And your keys are going to have a really big say in, in how data gets uh, distributed and where data is actually located. Um, it's a very astute question because it gets to the concept of, you know, uh, the concept of within a distributed database, like the physical location of the data uh, becomes a, a real, real critical piece. So that we have lots of resources. I know within our docs, um, we help you go through that decision of what that is. Um, but it is really kind of a different, I love this question because it, the question asks any races to help think in cockroach design. Um, I think that's a really good way of putting it because it is a different way of thinking. Um, it is a different way of thinking through the database itself. So I'm going to read through uh, one or two more of these here. Just give me a second. So you guys have a lot of good questions today. So Let's see. Some good stuff here. So one second here, everybody. So with the ability to horizontally scale, what are general guidelines for smaller nodes versus fewer, bigger nodes, CPU, memory, disk? Um, another great astute question because it gets into basically the physical nature of the data and then logical as well. Um, it, so this is a good question, and, and it really depends on what you want to accomplish. Um, you know, lots of smaller nodes uh, will actually probably improve your resiliency, whereas fewer bigger nodes uh, may improve uh, performance from a CPU and uh, power within each one of those nodes. And really comes back to what you want to accomplish um, in your application itself. You know. I, I like the concept of lots of small nodes because it allows us to, you know, especially in geo distributed um, global applications, um, because it allows you to get, uh, you know, a more rich distribution of data across more regions for both resiliency and, and, for, and for latency. Um, but it really comes down to what you want to actually, uh, what you want to accomplish with your database, with, with, the, with the database itself, right? So, um, it really comes back to if, if you want horizontal scale, then have, have small nodes. If you, if you think the, the compute and the, the performance within each particular node is more important, then, then you can scale up that node uh, from, a, from a hardware point of view. So let me look through. Let me get one more here. Some of them were very uh, exact questions in terms of something that I was talking about. So I want to get to something that's a little bit more generic. Um, uh, by the way, everything that was actually asked in the chat window or in the QA, um, we, will, um, we will answer uh, post-events as well. All right, here. One problem. Okay, so there's a question here about um, backup and restore in a distributed system and how that works. Um, uh, another one, that's a really interesting question. So backup and restore of data is just a concept in a, in a single node database. It's pretty simple, right? I just take a copy of the database, I back it up, uh, and I have that moment in time. I could actually restore for the backup if I needed to. Um, that's pretty simple. Um, in a distributed database, that, that's a little bit more of a challenge. I can't just take a picture of every node and all the data across all the nodes and create one single backup uh, in say like in one data center, right? That would actually violate the, the concepts of how I place data, right? Like if I wanna do geolocation and, and lots of organizations use uh, geopartitioning so they can meet things like privacy laws, right? They, they want data located in France that's created in France, right? They want data that's located in the US to be able to, or in Jersey to live in Jersey, right? Like, well, if you're, if you're just doing one big backup restore and you're creating all that data, like you've actually violated those issues of like where that data lives, right? Um, and so actually in CockroachDB, we are doing distributed backup and restore where it's basically a, a fairly complex undertaking of backup and restore on each node and then being able to actually compile that all into one bigger um, um, backup so that you actually have a restore point, just as you would think of in the database. Now, underneath the covers, it's extremely complex. Underneath the covers, 
we are actually taking care of these, these geo partitioning rules, everything else. Um, to you, the end user, uh, it just looks like a normal backup restore. Um, but that is actually, that's a really interesting question. I, I've never gotten that one on a, on a webinar before. So um, that's a good one. So I just wanted to, to, to wrap up um, again. Thank you everybody for, for your time today. That was, that was, wow, that was an hour long. Um, I hope this was, this was valuable to everybody. Um, there is a lot of questions here that I, that I do want to go through and answer for you guys and we'll do so afterwards. Um, and, uh, but we'll get this out to everybody. We will, um, we will send the answers to everybody. Um, if you're looking for a tutorial, how to get started with us, there's lots of stuff in our docs. Here's a, here's a quick link to it, cockroach.ch.tutorial or slash tutorial. And then, you know, cockroach, C-O-C, it's just cockroach with the dot in between the C and the H. It's so cute. Um, to, and you can go to Cockroach Cloud and actually spin up a cluster right now, um, which is actually pretty cool. So we actually have a, a, a hosted version of this, so you can start doing with this stuff today. So. Um, but I, I just, I got to give one more shout out to our docs. Um, if there is any of these concepts that you actually want to dive into, you want to learn more, um, our documentation and, and what the team does here is, is really phenomenal. Um, I'll say that I'll let you make your, your own decision on how phenomenal how the, the docs are, but, um, we, we get lots of compliments on that. So lots of stuff that I talked about here, um, is written in, in form there as well. So. Um, with that, I just wanted to thank everybody. Again, there's a survey that, uh, that will pop up uh, at the end of this. We would love to get the feedback um, so, so we can improve. And I wanted to thank everybody for taking an hour out of the day uh, to spend with us. Uh, thanks very much.